Hello, welcome back. So now we'll be talking about applications of uh, semiconductors. And this is in the sequence of uh, section two of materials. And so let's dive into the periodic table again, columns two through six, look at the elemental semiconductors. So silicon certainly is the, the most prominent uh, uh, material that is being used in the industry. It's literally a $260 billion industry and uh, it really thrives on silicon. Uh, on the right, you see an image of a silicon crystal uh, that is generated with the Crystal Viewer Lab on NanoHub, and you'll do, be doing some exercises with that tool, and you can view uh, planes and crystal symmetries. You can rotate this crystal around into unit cells and all the things we will be talking about in this course. All right, so um, another elemental semiconductor is germanium. The crystal structure actually looks very similar to that of silicon. And, uh, but what, uh, it happens here really is that, as I mentioned in the, uh, periodic table, as you go from left to right and from the top to the bottom, uh, the elements become larger and heavier. So germanium is larger and heavier than silicon. So it'll be on a larger lattice constant. So silicon and germanium have different lattice constants but they can mix. And uh, if they mix, it's a compound alloy, and it's a random alloy. It is not ordered, and here's an image of that, um, of such a sheet of silicon germanium. And you see it's random, and even though we might sketch that there's an interface that is sharp, you can clearly tell that um, the interface is not totally straight. So here you can see that there are voids that are not uh, perfectly ordered, and you can't really talk about a perfectly straight interface at the atomic scale. And if you are dealing with devices that are only a few nanometers small, then it becomes clear that interfaces are going to be important. And in fact, um, you have to manage such interface roughness quite carefully. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, what is critical then here to add is that the bond lengths are not exactly the same and actually that crystal is not perfectly ordered and there's no long range order either so you can't really describe it with a single unit cell all right so why do we care about these different lattice constants so much well, it's it's really being used in technology today and there's a sort of a, a sketch on how you can strain silicon on top of silicon germanium so in green you have a so a pictogram of a, a, a homogeneous silicon germanium, and I just showed you that that is not quite a, a, the proper image. But to, to illustrate how the larger lattice constant in silicon germanium is uh, uh, building a basis or a substrate, if you now grow silicon on top, the silicon has to stretch itself to fit on top of the, the substrate. And such uh, um, controlled strain silicon is being used to improve its electrical properties. And why is that? Well, if you change the bond length, you change how electrons are being shared, so to speak, you modify the electronic properties of this material, and you do this in a way um, that you achieve, say, a, a better transistor performance. Um, there's another uh, compound semiconductor, silicon carbon. Uh, uh, or silicon carbide that has a larger band gap. So you have different electronic properties in these compounds and, and silicon carbide is used for high power uh, electronic devices and uh, radiation harder devices. All right, so now let's uh, focus on these uh, uh, three, five semiconductors that were mentioned in the previous section. So typical candidates are gallium arsenide or indium phosphide as indicated in the, in the red shaded area. And these are typically used for light emitting diodes or for lasers or some high speed electronic uh, circuits, so custom circuits. And we'll be talking later in the course about devices that emit light or detect light. We'll talk about conduction and valence bands where electrons can be uh, uh, recombining an electron here could recombine with a hole that is down here. Energy is converted into a photon, 
And of course, uh, the inverse can happen as well. A photon comes in and it can knock an electron up into the conduction band and leave a hole behind. So you can really design artificial atoms, so to speak, where you can design specific wavelengths, etc. But those are typically done in 3-5 semiconductors, uh, not in compound semiconductors, and we'll learn why that preference exists. It has to do with uh, direct and indirect band gaps. All right. Now, uh, here's a, another classical um, material system, uh, uh, mercat, mercury, cadmium, and telluride. That material has been heavily used for infrared detectors. Um, it is uh, still being used today. Um, it is a challenge to deal with. Uh, it is very soft and it's, it's hard to deal with uh, as, as a, a material system. So advanced uh, infrared detectors uh, will use this kind of material system. And uh, here's an outlier now from the typical um, balancing of um, column four electrons. As I mentioned, we, we typically balance three fives or two sixes or stay within the column four. Lead sulfide is an outlier in that. It is one of the uh, first uh, materials uh, being used for semiconductor diodes. And it's, uh, it's very soft and it's difficult to deal with. I just wanted you to be aware that such an outlier of a material exists. It can still be semiconducting. Um, it is uh, so different than the standard semiconductors we typically deal with. So with that, what you have is really, a, in, a, in a sense, a Lego box, if you like Legos, uh, that you can build semiconductor devices with. You uh, utilize the chemical differences uh, that lead to different band gaps or different mobilities, or, uh, and you can uh, com uh, compose new systems that by, uh, in nature wouldn't occur. Not all combinations are possible. Um, due to uh, different uh, strain considerations, lattice mismatch, or room temperature instability. And uh, they, they serve different application purposes. So really, you have an, a materials toolbox. So with that, we're, we're concluding the section on typical applications, just as a really rapid overview. And in the next section, we'll be talking about atomic position and bond orientation. Thank you.